Greetings and welcome to Flanagan's Ecologic. I am your host, Ted Flanagan. And today I'm joined by Barry Cinnamon. He's the CEO of Cinnamon Energy Systems. Barry also has a podcast called The Energy Show. He's done over 500 episodes. He is an industry leader, somebody I greatly respect, and thus I'm psyched to have Barry on the podcast today. Hey, Barry, welcome to the podcast. It's very, very good to meet you. It's a pleasure, Ted. Um, I've heard about you, and, and once again, it's really glad to meet another fam- world-famous podcaster. <laughs> and where are you sitting right now as we speak? I'm sitting in my office in Los Gatos, which is in a, a 70-year-old school building that when we moved in about uh, four years ago, we completely renovated. It's, it's all electric, and everything is, is electric, heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, the LED lighting. But it's taken us, uh, we still haven't installed the solar on the roof yet because really? we had to do roofing upgrades. But once that's done, then we'll be all set, including plenty of EV chargers for our fleet. Oh, it sounds really great. And, and I, I've already introduced you as the CEO of Cinnamon Energy Systems. And uh, what's, what are you working on today or this week? What's hot? Um, it, we're, what's, what's kind of interesting for us is we're um, scrambling to hit our numbers for the year, but we're also ramping up our heat pump business. And so that's something we started uh, about a year and a half ago, really just dabbling. Um, But when the IRA came through, we realized that there was opportunity. And the main opportunity is really just cross-selling with panel upgrades and solar and batteries and EV chargers. And then people want heat pump water heaters and heat pump HVAC. So I'm spending a lot of time doing that. Um, uh, Once a month, I go back to heat pump school, which I hadn't done in almost 40 years. And uh, it's, it's a really good compliment to our business. How fantastic. Well, we're going to get to your business model a little, little later in the show. I have a few things I just want to start out with. You have, you've been podcasting now for how many years? Um, I started doing blogs in 2007. I, was, I started on the radio in t- 2013. And then uh, that, those all ended up as podcasts. And then when the radio went away, it's just pure podcasts. That's fantastic. And it's, and it's called The Energy Show. Yes. And you come out, is it weekly? It's, it's weekly now. Um, and it's kind of a combination of uh, interviews with, with great people like you. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, things that just kind of come to the top of my head that I think are really important that I want to talk to people about. And, and it's just kind of just me talking and, and uh, showing slides and, and discussing numbers. And, and what would you say is the most far out episode that you ever, that you ever had or the most often, one of those memorable discussions that it's a good question the, the i'm just thinking about the ones that got the most attention and we did an episode about last jan in january 2024 this year and it was right after pg e raised the rates again and we were working with the solar alliance which is a, a group a, a pretty good group run by david rosenfeld that is really a, 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 a grassroots advocacy group and David and his team had pulled together the data for California politicians looking at how much money the utilities and the utilities uh, employees had contributed. And there was just a really, really interesting correlation between the magnitude of political donations that were accepted by basically everybody from the governor on down to the alignment that these same politicians had with um, you know, encouraging uh, crazy electric rates and utility investments. And, you know, basically the point was, if you're wondering why your electric bill is so high, it's because your politicians voted for this, you know, these increases. And if you want to reduce your electric bills, you have to vote, you know, not vote those people in. And then, by the way, there's a little bit of a self-serving message in there. And the only other darn thing you can do is put in solar and storage. <laughs> well, it's a good, it's a, it's a really good segue into the very, very first thing I wanted to hit with you because I, I did listen to one of your podcasts with Bernadette Del, Del Chiaro and you were talking about uh, if we really want to understand why the utilities in California are tanking distributed solar uh, or at least making it very, very difficult to make it cost effective, uh, it's got a lot to do with politics and you were very explicit about that. So, um, you want to just uh, you want to could you just sort of frame we we've we've taken a huge hit with this the transition from net metering 1.0 to 2.0 and now we have 3.0 which everybody's calling net billing which has got the very very low export credits um, 
and you 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 were you've been quite outspoken that that it's really explic it's understandable what happened here. Yeah, it, it, you know, I, I kind of look at the situation and I say, what's the problem, and what, what can we do about it? Um, we also do monthly seminars, and the message to get see you know people to our seminar last week was, did you know that your electric rates went up fifty four percent over the past two years? And it's you know, it, it's just kind of crazy. So the linkage between uh, money going into um, ratepayer money collected by investor-owned utilities going directly to the politicians. It's just an ironclad linkage. I mean, you look at what what happened with Governor Newsom, whom I, I sometimes um, not, not not politely call him Governor No Son. Um, he 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 accepted five million dollars worth of contributions in 2022 for his reelection campaign. And that money came from PG&E and the IBEW. There's another dozen politicians, all of whom took over three hundred thousand dollars. These are the leaders in the uh, California Assembly and the Senate that that took the same, you know, three or four hundred thousand dollars or more each. And it's it's so ironic to me because Governor um, when when he was mayor of of San Francisco, um, Newsom was really in favor of solar. He helped put the the San Francisco solar program in place. I was at the signing ceremony. My daughter actually has the pen he used to sign the huh. San Francisco solar program into effect. And then for purely political reasons, because it doesn't, doesn't make any economic sense, but for purely political reasons, he and many other California legislators are, are just in the pockets of the utility. And you look at what he did affect, you know, when he, when he, when he was reelected, he basically cleaned out the Public Utilities Commission and put in all people that would vote the way he wanted. And the votes have been consistently five for utility um, energy systems and zero for anything that would be affiliated with distributed generation or behind the meter solar. So the linkage is there. And so you kind of take, like me, take a step back and say, gee, what can we do? Yeah. And yeah. one thing we can do is what um, assembly member, I think it was, he's assembly member Min, or maybe he's a senator, I'm not sure. He sponsored a bill this year that basically said utilities can't use ratepayer money. In other words, money we pay the utilities on yeah. our electric bill. They can't use that ratepayer money to lobby the government. And that's a great bill and similar bills have been floated in other parts around the, in other states around the country. But sure enough, the utilities lobbied against that with our money and yeah. it, we never even saw it got out of committee. Well, I hate to be—I hate to sound cynical, but I think they would use shareholder money for the same for the same purpose if they needed to. Yes, you're exactly right, but it's <laughs> it's it's not as at it's, least it's, it's a less. step. It's it's not it's as overt. Step. It's yes, not as overt. Yes. So so it's to you. It's and, and it was really made crystal clear when you and Bernadette were describing this in the, in the podcast that it's really understandable what's happened to solar in California. It's just all political. It's just the, the regulations have changed. The incentives have been stripped away. Fortunately, the price of panels is coming down, so there's there's some countervailing trends going on. But it's really it's it's very clear cut change of regulation, and all of a sudden, what residential installs are down? I think over sixty percent in California. Yeah, it's clobbered seventy. Uh, they're down by sixty or seventy percent. The um, the bat the battery installation rate is down. Now the attachment rate is up, but we're still putting in fewer batteries because fewer people want solar. Um, yeah. And then it's really the cost of a solar installation now. Has bumped up by fifteen to twenty thousand dollars because you need a battery, and yeah. and in, although the utilities were saying solar is cost shift from rich people to poor people, we're going to fix that. They're making it a lot worse. It's really you know you've added fifteen thousand dollars to the cost of the system. Right, and just so just for some of our listeners, I, I've had some other discussions about this before, but basically with this net billing, this net metering three point oh that we we tried to call it for a while there. When you're over generating at your home or your business and that power is going back into the grid, you used to get the retail value for that or you used to get 85% of the retail value. And, and now with the avoided cost calculator, Barry, there's times where you just don't get anything or many hours of the year, you just don't get anything, right? So, you, so the, per, exactly. the, the, trick, the trick now is to self-consume. That's the only way you can maintain the value of the solar. But as you're saying, Barry, Self-consuming, uh, yeah, you can do that to a point, but then you need batteries, and the batteries add a lot of capital cost to the system. So, yeah, yeah, it's frustrating. You know, you look at the most productive days of the year. You know, it's spring and fall. Um, yeah. Basically, at zero. The only time you can make money is in September, and you can get an average of two dollars and eighty-three cents uh, an hour, a kilowatt hour. 
but for, that's for a couple days, be. a couple days, I think E3 modeled and they found it was worth a couple dollars for a couple days and the rest of the year it's nothing. right? But, but that's when you need your air conditioning and you, right. you know, people aren't going to say, gee, I want to just, you know, make five bucks, but they're going to roast. Now, do you mind if I ask you a question? Cause, cause there's yeah. something that's very relevant to your experience here. Sure. Well, you can ask me anything you want. All right. Well, I was, uh, I don't know how I was bouncing around the internet and I bumped into an old report by the Rocky Mountain Institute called Grid Defection. Yeah. And, and there's a really interesting fork in the road that they talk about. One fork, the high road, is where um, the utilities would make it easy for people to put a distributed generation. There would be fair rates. Um, they encourage, um, you know, batteries, solar, et cetera. Yeah. And then there's the, the, the bad fork in the road, the low fork. Um, which is basically we're following that path exactly. The yeah. utilities are restricting distributed generation. They're um, putting in huge fixed charges. They're creating what are going to be called stand uh, stranded assets. In other words, they're overbuilding, and then people yeah. are going to defect from the grid. And that's exactly what happens. And, and yeah. it's just it was so prescient for RMI to, to put that out. And it was and now I'm bummed out that we're actually following that path exactly. It's it's just it's terrible. Well, you're you're we're just on the same. Like, our conversation is just flowing nicely because I was I was wondering how this is going to get resolved. Our California solar problem, and one one way that it gets resolved is grid defection. I mean, the utilities, the rates go up and up and up. More people are more people decide that they're going to go off the grid. They're defecting from the grid. Utility goes into a death spiral. It's a it's a real bummer. And then only the people that can't afford to to defect. <laughs> Are, are stuck. It's a very regressive policy. They're, they're stuck holding the all of the stranded assets from the utility. It seems to me there's the the grid defection is yeah we don't want to we don't want to go there. And we'll talk about the benefits of staying on the grid, but you know what what are the other options? I I I've always been an advocate, Barry, that you should let the utilities get into the solar business, and the utilities should you know be able to count distributed generation in their RPS. And they ought to be able to make a, a rate of return, maybe even a, Havana would probably say even a preferential rate of return on their solar investments. But we just haven't let the utilities do that, right? So I had a discussion about that with a friend of mine, good friend of mine. His name is also Barry. He used to be a board member at pg e for many, many years. Um, and I asked him, how come, Barry, that when I fly into San Jose, I see lots and lots of buildings without any solar on them? Uh, many. I mean, you got to really squint to find, you know, blue panels on a white roof. I fly into Newark, New Jersey, and almost every flat roof is covered with blue solar panels. I said, yeah. why is that? He said, well, at pg e we tried to actually own the solar that was on top of those rooftops in California. And yeah. what they found is that there was a leasing rate that they would have to pay that was <clears throat> more than the utility wanted to spend and less than the customer would save if they put on their own solar panels. So yeah. the economics just kind of didn't click, and I I don't know if it ever will. Um, but yeah. that was that was on commercial, so I don't know if residential work any better. Yeah, well, it's, it's it's I'm glad you brought up New Jersey. I mean, there was a time I was we were hired to look for a, a property developer all over the country. Actually, it was a strip mall owner all over the country, a mall owner all over the country, and you know they wanted to create a they wanted to create a solar business. They figured they had a lot of rooftops; they should use them hired EcoMotion to figure out where to put them. And we pushed them to push them to New Jersey. And they were like, what? There's no sun in New Jersey. <laughs> but at the time, you had the, the SREX in New Jersey that were the most attractive in the country. And we were really rivaling Germany in our install rates in New Jersey for, for a period there. Yeah, yeah. No, there's public service, electric and gas. I'm from New Jersey, so I knew. And the first place in, in my old company, Akina, when, when I, in 2003, when I started looking at expanding and we already had a bunch of offices in California, I said, well, how about New Jersey? So um, I, I flew out there. I met with some friends. I, I rented some from a warehouse space in Fairfield, New Jersey, um, from a, uh, one of the mafia guys who was kind of controlling that. And it was just, you know, it was a, a Jersey solar business. And it did great. We, yeah. we really killed it until the the rebates went down and I had to shut down the company for a year. And then two years later, I opened it up again. But that was the challenge of expanding around the country. I did it in New York, Connecticut, uh, Colorado, where there just wasn't stability with the yeah. incentives. And, yeah. and, and it's, it's affecting everybody still right now. Let's talk a little more about grid defection, because obviously what if, between solar now and batteries, and I suppose you could you could put a generator in there for that 1% of the time that you need to have you know, a backup resource. 
but you really got a situation where you could just disconnect from the utility altogether, right? Um, and I think that a number of customers are game to do that. And I think many more customers are not game. They're not willing to be a utility, be their own, you know, run their own power plant in their operations, right? Um, what, what's your, what's your reaction to that? Do you think, are you finding that, that more and more customers are interested in defecting from the grid at this point? I, th th there's a lot of customers that basically want to give the middle finger to the utility. They just want to get out. They'll pay a lot of money to do it. They've got the money. So there's two barriers to defecting. Um, one barrier is the policies that the utilities have in place to make it almost impossible for you to do that. Um, and the second barrier is cost. I mean, it's really nice to have the utility on that winter evening when your heat pump right. is cranking and your batteries are dead. Yeah. So it's a, it's a policy and a technology problem. But here's the thing. With the, the, the growth of electric vehicles with big honking, you know, 100 kilowatt hour batteries. I have a Ford Lightning. It's 130 kilowatt hours. Um, if you can plug that battery into your house and rely on that battery, it really works. Utilities have, every utility has a basement dungeon where they're just brainstorming on how to frustrate the distributed generation industry and how to stop it, what kind of laws and regulations. So there's a lot of regulations in place. Fundamentally, one of the regulations is you can't run a wire from yeah. one house to another. You just can't yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, so, so, but you're on your own. You can, you're on your own. <laughs> right. But you can drive your battery from one <laughs> building to another. And yeah. what occurred to me is we're, we, have, we have solar. We'll have solar on the roof in our office here. I, I, my employees can charge up for free. Um, solar energy on the grid is really cheap during the day. Commercial solar is really cheap. You're not making any money selling it back because there's no more net metering. So it encourages companies to allow people to charge up their vehicles during the day. And then what you do is you drive that full battery home after you charge it up for eight hours at work and you plug it into your home solar battery system. And you can't use that energy in the battery to send it back to the grid. But right. if the control system is set up properly, which is what Tesla is doing and SolarEdge is doing and Enphase is doing and Franklin is doing, when you need to draw the power from your vehicle, you disconnect from the grid. So that's something that, that is being piloted. And basically you plug in your, your vehicle and when your home battery is dead and your house needs energy, it just pulls the energy from the vehicle. The easiest way to do that is using the AC output of the vehicle. So it's not a full blown vehicle to grid, multi, you know, multi voltage DC thing. You're just using the generator output. The Tesla Cybertruck has that output. The Ford Lightning has that output and I'm sure other vehicles will have that output. So the hardware will be available the control systems will be available from the major vendors. And that makes it pretty easy to defect from the grid. It really does. I had a fun conversation in a bar a couple nights ago up in Portland, Oregon, with a naysayer. We were talking energy, you know, a naysayer about solar and wind and every other darn thing. I said, I got to tell you about VGI. I bet you've never heard of this. And I told him about this Dutch football stadium where you know, 10,000 cars can hook up to the stadium and power the, power the stadium and power the game. And he said, oh, my God, I wonder if that would work for the ferries up in the Puget Sound. And I said, well, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? Because they're having a hard time bringing electrical service into all these ferry terminals. And if you had all these cars, now I have a Chevy Bolt. I think I have 67 kilowatt hours on board. We also have a Tesla Model Y. I think that's 75 kilowatt hours. I like to say to people, you know, most of the time our EVs are just sitting there, right? You know, for most of us, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, our, our assets are expensive Battery assets are just sitting there, so why not, why not flex them? I, I'm glad you brought it up. I think it's just such a huge part of uh, part of what gives me optimism about a sustainable energy future is that we can just use all of our cars to support to, to support the grid. Yeah, and and we're we're the the way that cars are being charged right now is backwards. We're, the utilities want us to charge the cars at night. That's when there's the least amount of power available. What we really should be charging the cars is during the day, when in many cases, power is free. There are negative electricity costs. Yeah, yeah. So if everybody's soaking up that power in the day, you know, maybe they're adding 10 or 20 kilowatt hours to their battery, then they drive it home. It tremendously relieves the congestion on the grid. It solves that, that evening and nighttime duck curve problem. But there is, it does create one other 
almost insurmountable problem. And that's that it's less profits for the utilities. It comes back to the utility business model, which is, you know, fundamentally something that we need to, to modify. Right. Well, you know, my friend Brian Hennigan, who heads up the Holy Cross Energy out in Colorado, what did he say? Basically, utilities are going to be brokers. They're going to be managing, they're going to be managing or networking microgrids. Totally different business model. And it's not going to be about selling power. It's going to be about facilitating exchanges of power. And I think that's a, a, a fantastic role for the utilities. And, and I keep coming back to, I think the utility should be selling solar and wind and selling efficiency services and lighting services. I think there's a, a lot of different, a lot of different revenue options for utilities that have been yeah. put on the, put on the back burner. We spent time over in Europe looking at chauffagistes and heat service models over there and fascinating stuff that puts the onus on the utility to make you more efficient and deliver the best, uh, the, the best resource to your, to your door. Yeah. yeah, but it's 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 really hard to correlate that with the two point three billion dollars of profits that PG and E made last year. Yeah. They're not going to get to those same numbers by by enabling microgrids. They're good. they get to those numbers by convincing the Public Utilities Commission through the you know influencing yeah. to you know put in ten thousand miles of underground power lines to ramp up our, our infrastructure so that we can meet the wildest dreams of AI yeah. um, and just, just to crank all those investments because they make tremendous profits on that. Yeah. You saw all this coming. I know uh, you're prescient, but you're also just very knowledgeable about the market. You saw what was happening with regulations in California. You took cinnamon solar and you transformed it into cinnamon energy systems. So you've 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 been able to flex with the market and as you were describing earlier you've gotten into heat pumps and heat pump water heaters uh electric vehicle chargers uh it's exciting stuff and and there's lots of funding for that right now it just as we're all bemoaning the california lack of incentives on the on the net energy metering all of a sudden there's the ira funding that's that's big right yeah that that's that's a very attractive shiny thing and um there's it, there's no doubt in my mind that everybody is going to be converting to heat pump water heaters and heat pump hvac systems it just takes time to change out that old equipment um the only frustrating thing is it's been you know it's been uh, two years and, and a month since the ira was signed and those rebates are not available yet in in i think almost every state except for new york so the government's been very slow to let those rebates out um, mm -hmm. There are local rebates for heat pumps and especially heat pump water heaters. One of the dirty secrets, and, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm guilty of this too, is in general, contractors hate rebate programs with a yeah. lot of paperwork. Yeah. And um, I, I've, I'm, I'm like that also because a lot of times what happens, I mean, I'll give you an example for a heat pump water heater. Um, you can get a $2,500 incentive for the heat pump water heater, but you've got to get a building permit. You've got to upgrade your um, system, your, your hot water system with an expansion tank and special valves. And very often, for, you know, when the hot water heater dies, you got a puddle on your garage floor in your basement and you need it replaced right away, right away. The getting that incentive because you need permission to get the incentive before you can start the project getting the incentive is in the way but hmm. the tax credits are hmm. tremendous the solar tax credits have been great the two thousand dollar tax credits for heat pump water heaters and heat pump hvac it's money in the bank for everybody but it's yeah. not that eight thousand dollar credit that you think you might get on a heat pump Right. Interesting. Are you also finding that your clients need to upgrade their electrical service coming into their homes and businesses to accommodate for more electricity demand? We were pleasantly surprised and, and a little bit overwhelmed at the amount of work it takes to do that. But a, a significant percentage of our customers have 100 or 125 amp electrical services and they, they need a new electrical panel. If it's an above ground service where the wires are in the sky, pretty straightforward, you know, maybe a six month project. But if there's digging involved, that that's a 12 to 18 month project and it could very frequently get over $20,000. So it's just very complicated to do in some neighborhoods, but high percentage of people want it. And then there are new products. You know, this is span panel and Schneider's got something yeah. similar and, and Newman's yeah. got something similar that they can kind of get people through, but still, you know, at the end of the day, if you have a hundred or 120 van service and you're going to put in HV, a heat pump HVAC and a heat pump water heater, you're going to have two EVs, you're going to have electric induction cooktops. Um, it's kind of stretching what you can really do. So right. you need that upgrade. Right, right. 
If, do, you, do you have a, it, it sounds fantastic to go back to your, your, you probably have lots of happy clients. They've done solar and storage, solar with you, maybe, maybe some of them have done storage with you. And now you're going back to them. They're all, and I guess awareness levels are raising about climate change and need for electrification. And, and, are, and so they must be excited to have you come back to them and take the next step. Is that, is that fair to say? It's, it's, it's very, it's accurate. Um, and it, it, it depends on having a longstanding business. It depends on making sure that you provide, you've always provided good customer service, that you have good referrals. Yeah. And so, you know, when I kind of look at the, the solar industry landscape, there's some companies that have been business a long time. And there's some companies that are, let's just say very aggressive and, and kind of in and out and just aren't sustainable. Um, but we're, we're in the former category and, and we do get a lot of that, that cross referral. Um, and then we also get, you know, once in a while, we're doing a lot of new construction, new custom homes, and those are bigger projects. It's like do everything. Yeah. Um, and then we're getting other people who just say, well, hey, I just um, want to put in the heat pump HVAC and the battery and the solar and get it all done at once. And, you know, those are very good projects. They're expensive, um, but the customers are really happy and then we get good referrals. Are there some cities that, that still require you put in natural gas service in, in new construction? It's what happened. Berkeley was the first city that said you, you, they banned it. Yeah. But then the then natural gas back. industry managed yeah. to overturn that ban. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not really familiar what the status of that is right now. Yeah. But, you know, for new construction, most people are just they're going all electric. Um, yeah. the, the induction cooktops, I mean, even they're my great. wife likes it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're great. Let's just, we have a few more minutes. Let's just quickly, you know, fire up your background. People are always interested in, in uh, I, I get lots of feedback on these podcasts. They, they love the mushy stuff or the, some of the trivial stuff. But you mentioned that you grew up in New Jersey. Is that right? Yeah, I, I, I kind of, I, I have, my background is a little bit unusual because I've been doing solar for, you know, since the late seventies, I, I went to college in, in Cambridge, MIT, studied solar, and I had to kind of create my own solar course. I had my, my solar thermal system on the roof of the nuclear engineering building in 79 and 80, which was, you know, <laughs> that was the hot concept then. Yeah. I went work for a solar startup in the early, uh, you know, for a few years, and that company tanked because could get venture money and that intense incentives went away. I then spent a few years working for the very, one of the very first ground coupled heat pump companies. So we dug mm. deep wells yeah. into the ground and then pulled the heat out. Um, and I'm an engineer and very, very straightforward. And I told my boss, gee, you know, the average cost of drilling the hole in the ground through the rock in, Mass in Massachusetts was more than that customers could conceivably save with this ground coupled heat pump. Um, and, and, you know, he said, yeah, well, that's too bad. Um, then you're fired. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I, um, couldn't find a job in solar. I went to business school. I got out of business school and I, I couldn't find another job in solar in 86. So I spent 15 years in the software industry, yeah. started yeah. up a few companies, took one public. Then when the internet crushed it, I started up Akina solar in, in Saratoga, California. And then we, we went public, we grew, we were national, became you, Westinghouse solar. I sold that. Became the biggest, then, didn't you, didn't you become the biggest residential installer in America? We were the biggest. We, we were the biggest residential installer. This was before Sunrun, before yeah. Solar City. You know, we were. I bought. I bought one of your. I bought one of your systems, by the way, in Glendale. <laughs> Akina Solar. Oh, that's, yes. That's 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 good. Down and was it out of the um, Woodland Hills office or Anaheim office? I can. I think it would have been Woodland Hills. Yeah, yeah. We had seven offices in California. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then when I sold Westing, and we partnered with Westing, I was created Westing. So when I sold that, it's like I, I was bored for like a month. And then customers said, I, I want more solar. I want to move. So I started up Cinnamon Solar. And then it just, we've yeah. just been growing steadily without, you know, outside capital and yeah. and managing to be profitable. And, and uh, it's, it's just kind of what I like. So I kind of, I look at my yeah. background, I say, I really didn't go anywhere. I stayed in the solar for 40 you know, <laughs> something years. I like it. It's in my blood. And yeah. Uh, I'm not going to change. I can tell you like it. I can tell you like it and that you're good at it and your customers must, must love you. How do you, um, on a personal note, how do you keep balance? Do you look like you're healthy and, and doing well? What, what, how, do you, how do you do that? You're, you're working hard, I'm sure. Yeah, fortunately, my wife and I, we eat well. We like to cook, um, but not the same quantities that we used to have family over. But we exercise a lot. Yeah. So um, I'll usually drive my car home around 11 o'clock or noon and then ride my bicycle back to work. 
All right. And my, my wife is my boss here and uh, she's the managing director of finance. So she gives me a ride home on the bicycle so I can do it again. <laughs> and then maybe once a week I do a, a jog up and down the hill, uh, Los Gatos Hill. Yeah. And I did that this morning. So I'm, you know, kind feeling of energy, good today. You know, I'm feeling yeah. good and exercise. <laughs> and good and about yourself here. today. So that's, it's, it's yeah. that balance, but, you know, work really hard, you know, usually seven to seven. Yeah. And, uh, you know, taking an hour and a half off every once in a while for lunch. But um, that, that's a, it's a good life, and I like it. And it got my kids through college. And I'm very, very proud that they're all pretty much off the payroll, except for one who's on the company payroll doing customer service uh, out of our Arkansas office. Um, she's just the only one there. And yeah. um, I'm very proud when we have team meetings. We've got about 50 people. And there's, you know, a lot of young people and, and families that are just kind of supported doing solar and batteries and now heat pumps. So it's a, I that's like great. it. Good luck. That's really great. Well, congratulations and uh, thank you for what you're doing uh, in the industry and thank you for your time here this afternoon. Really enjoyed talking to you. T Ted, a pleasure. And I didn't know you were an Akita customer from way back and it's great to hear. And, um, you know, just, and, and you're happy customers and, and your podcasts are terrific. I'm, I'm, I enjoy them. Yeah, thanks for saying so. Have a great afternoon. All right. You too. All right. Thanks, Ted. Bye. That's it. Thanks for listening to Flanagan's Ecologic. We'll see you next time.